365 days from now, Ontarians will render their verdict on the previous four years of Kathleen Wynne's administration in this province. Here representing the Liberal government is the Deputy Premier and MPP for London North Centre, Deb Matthews. Nice to have you in that chair again. Great to be here. Well, I want to know what you think the most important thing your party has to do in order to be re-elected one year from tonight. I think what we have to do is tell the story of what we're doing and how we're making life better for ordinary Ontarians for, you know, whether it's free tuition for uh, over 200,000 students, whether it's uh, drug free drug coverage for people under age 25, whether it's the changes we're announced, we've announced on minimum wage, 100,000 more childcare spaces. We're doubling the capacity of childcare across the province over the next five years. A range of things that we've done that uh, we get, need to get out and talk about. People need to understand what our values are and how we're acting on those values. I know you guys think you have a good news story to tell, and yet the polls suggest, and I know polls are worth, you know, what you pay for, but, you know, they suggest that either the word is not, is not getting out or people are not on side with your agenda. What do you think is going on? You know, I, I don't pay a lot of attention to polls between elections, and if you actually did a study and looked at what the polling numbers say a year before an election, what they say at the beginning of the election, what the results are. If there's any correlation, it's a negative correlation. So I think for us, we know what we want to do. We're liberals. We've worked really hard to get to balance. You know, we've had the first balanced budget this year in almost a decade. In, in almost a decade. And the economy is growing faster in Ontario than anywhere else in the country leading the G7 country, so we're doing a really good job on economic growth. Our, we've got our, our uh, books in order, and that gives us the freedom to do the things we've been wanting to do for a long time. So let's grant you all of that, but then ask the follow-up question, then why are the Premier's popularity numbers personally so in the tank? So I get to work with Kathleen Wynne every day. I am a huge admirer of her. Um, and my caucus, my cabinet colleagues, we all think the world of her. I've given up trying to understand how some politicians are popular and some aren't. She is a remarkable woman with a remarkable work ethic. She really leads with her values. She's got all the ingredients, and I look forward to the, the campaign and the lead-up to the campaign where she's going to get out and talk to more people, and they're going to be able to say, you know what? That is the woman I want to leave my province. You may have stopped asking the question, but I have not, because I'm truly intrigued by the fact that, that you know liberals everywhere tell me they really like her, they think she's... They think she connects with people. They think she's a hard worker, all of the above. Uh, so I'm really curious about this. Do you, do you think, I mean, you're a demographer before you got into politics, so you understand a lot about people and how they think. And do you think her gender has anything to do with the fact that she's not more popular? You know, I've asked myself that question many times, and I don't know what the answer is. I just don't know what the answer is. But the reality is, she's a woman, and she's fantastic, and she's going to work hard. We're all going to work hard. and. Uh, and see what the people say a year from okay, today. Okay, so you're dodging that one. Let me try another one. Uh, do you think her sexual orientation has anything to do with her low popularity? I don't think so. I think um, the people who had a problem with that uh, had a problem with it, still have a problem with it. But I don't, uh, I don't think so. I think it's uh, just part of who she is. Well, let me try another option here, because I do hear this criticism when I ask, and I ask people this question every day. Yeah. You know, what do you think of the premier? What do you, do you have an answer? Well, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm exploring. Yeah, I really am looking yeah. into it. And, and the criticism I do hear fed back to me most frequently is she's not who we thought she was. She got elected three years ago on I'm different. I'm nicer. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to be like what came before me. And then some things have taken place over the intervening three years to make people conclude, oh, God, she's just like every other bloody politician who's broken our hearts. Do you hear that? So what I hear is that the people, you know, go back to what she did on pension reform. We want people to have a comfortable retirement. We, we, we uh, went from having an Ontario retirement pension plan to the nation now is going to have enhanced pension. Free tuition, child care spaces, doubling the number of spots available, all of the initiatives. You know, we've, we've announced the, the uh, increase of the minimum wage, wage Paid sick well, days. This is all true, these but, are, but you've also These got... are the expressions of her I values. He I hear it's you. who she is. I hear you. She's bold, she's brave, and she's driving change. But there's also police investigations, and there's also, you know, a coming court case in September, and there's also 
uh, you know, still fallout from gas plants, and there's also, you know, a lot of monkey business around the Sudbury by-election that took place that got Glenn Tebow into your government. And, and all of that gets fed back to me in, oh, she's just like everybody else. Well, is she? She is, she is an extraordinary person, and she's unlike anybody I've ever worked with. Okay. I wasn't expecting you to change your mind, but I just thought I'd put that out there and see what you had to say about it. Uh, you know Greg Cerbera. I do know Greg Cerbera. You sat in caucus with, and cabinet with Greg Cerbera for a while. He was on this program not too long ago, and here's what he had to say about your future prospects. Roll it, please. Unless things change dramatically, the Ontario Liberal Party, sadly, is going to lose the next election. And if that happens, the Premier will resign after that, and there will be a leadership and a renewal of the person at the top. So I would say you have to ask yourself, Premier, whether, given that scenario, it's better to step down before the next election and do what Dalton McGuinty did, did and let someone else give it a try, or to stay and uh, try and pull it through. But, you know, I have, uh, I've talked to a lot of Liberals who are, frankly, despondent about their prospects. Uh, sitting members and ministers who say, if the election were held today, I'd come in third. How despondent do you think your party is right now? You know, I don't think we're despondent. I think I think the, we, we've had a we've had a, a rough go, no question about it. Uh, but we were all out canvassing on the weekend, and I've spoken to some of my colleagues who are out knocking on doors, and I was out myself, and it feels a lot better than. I actually expect it, to be honest. You, you just came third in the Sault Ste. Marie by-election. How can it feel yeah, better? by-elections are, as you know this, by-elections are, yeah. are not predictive of anything. Mm -hmm. um, but I think people are starting to hear exactly what we're doing on the agenda for uh, um, making life better for people. Do you I run think... into people who think Kathleen Wynne ought to step down before the next election and give somebody else a turn? Oh, of course I do. And everybody does. And that would be true no matter who our leader was. But She's staying, and I'm really happy she's staying. And uh, we'll, be, we'll be back, and you'll, uh, uh, you'll see how terrific a campaign she ran. Uh, you have made, your government has made, numerous quote-unquote good news announcements that ought to have found a lot of favor in a place like Sault Ste. Marie, where a higher minimum wage would be welcomed, where a balanced budget would be welcomed, where labor changes you know, extra vacation time and, and, you know, you want to change the shift, there's going to be a financial penalty for doing yeah. so, all that kind of stuff. You would think those kinds of announcements would find favor in Sault Ste. Marie and your candidate lost 30 points, 35 points, I think, from the last time uh, David Orizetti won the seat just uh, three years ago. What, what do you count? I mean, how do you count for that? Uh, so, as I said earlier, by-elections are, are by-elections. They're, uh, uh, they're tough on government, for sure. Uh, I think the NDP is probably wondering what went wrong there for them. We've, uh, you know, I, I, I don't put a lot of stock in by-elections. We'll see what happens in the general election. I mean, yeah, that's all true, but it's sort of, it's an important, um, it, it, I mean, it's beyond a poll, right? It's an actual tangible piece of evidence. But it to is not a barometer of who you want to be your premier. And that's what a general election does. It chooses a government. It chooses a premier. A by-election does it. It gives you an opportunity to uh, uh, send the government a message. And our message is we've, uh, we've still got work to do, but we've got the right things in place. I mean, bringing the price of hydro down by 25% and significantly more than that, for people who pay the highest prices, people in rural and remote areas. Now, that's a new policy just went in June the 1st. Do you think that has now solved the hydro crisis in the province? Uh, people aren't seeing that yet. The, uh, the, they saw the first 8%. The remainder will come in the summertime on their bills. So when people start to see that, I think that will uh, uh, definitely... Uh, people will take notice of that and save the government hers. There's, uh, you know, there's a... It's a little inside baseball, but there's a job at Queen's Park called the Financial Accountability Officer. And he's a neutral, nonpartisan guy whose job it is to look at government policies and basically cost them out and, you know, yeah. give, it, give it the once over. And it is his view that this policy of essentially making electricity cheaper today will, over the next almost three decades, cost us an additional $21 billion as we kick those costs down the road. Is that a wise expenditure of $21 billion in your view? Yes, I think it was what we had to do. We had uh, 
Uh, it's like extending your mortgage. You might, when you buy a house, think, oh, I can pay this off in 20 years. But then, as you make those monthly payments, you think, you know, I'm going to refinance that. I'm going to have a longer period of payback. Of course, that costs more money. And anybody who's ever had a mortgage knows that if they added up all their monthly payments, it would be far more than the price they paid for their house. The difference in, I hear that analogy all the time, and the difference is that's you making a decision for yourself to charge yourself more in the long run. I hear the Premier talk all the time about wanting to make this province better for her children and grandchildren, yes. but she's just added $21 billion, not to her costs, but to her children's and grandchildren's costs. Is that fair? It is absolutely fair. And it's fair because those kids are going to be able to benefit from the infrastructure that we've invested. We've spent $50 billion building a stronger electricity system. It's not something anybody sees unless you're driving down a country road and you see the new hydro poles, the new wires. That's what this infrastructure is all about. And it'll be there for a long time. And so we'll spread the payments out over the, the, the life of that infrastructure. Let's talk about the Premier and the Mayor of her capital city, yes. uh, of which uh, she represents. She has a seat in it. I remember when John Tory got elected the Mayor of Toronto, she was quoted, she was out overseas I think at the time, and she was quoted as saying, hallelujah. <laughs> She's not saying hallelujah anymore. They're not getting along so well. How come? Well, I, I, I think that, uh, and of course I'm not from Toronto, but I do watch this with uh, significant interest. Uh, somehow, I think the government of Toronto, the mayor, has forgotten that we're paying 100% of the Eglinton Crosstown. That's a big, big, big expenditure. Six billion. If you look at all the investments we've made in transit in Toronto, it's a very significant investment. The things we're doing on housing, very significant investment. So I don't know whether he overpromised and whether he can't afford to deliver what he said he would deliver, so he's got to find somebody to blame that on. But I can tell you that uh, my constituents in London uh, think that maybe Toronto's getting too much well, attention, no, I, I, too I, much I, I, money. Of course, everybody outside Toronto yeah. thinks that, and, and you know that's fine. Uh, but the Premier, after giving the Mayor of Toronto every indication that he was going to be allowed to toll two yeah. of the highways that he's responsible for, she did a 180 and said, not going to happen. How damaging but do you think that was? Time, uh, okay, gave her, gave him more gas tax the money. The equivalent that he projected he'd get in tolls is what how much he's getting in gas the, tax the money. The difference is he has to beg her for that money instead of be responsible for raising it himself. He doesn't have to beg for it. It's there. Double the tax, the, the double the amount of money going on gas tax to every municipality across the province, and he starts to collect that money immediately instead of having to put all the infrastructure for tolling. It's there until some future premier, or maybe who knows even this premier, decides, okay, I can't afford to do it anymore and can, and can well, claw it back. Well, that argument would apply if uh, somebody took away the right to toll. Which she did. She never granted the right to toll. Uh, okay. The, uh, bottom line, politically speaking, was that a big mistake and did it end up damaging her relationship with him? No, it, I think it was absolutely the right decision. Uh, and. Uh, you know, I think at the core, John Tory and Kathleen Wynne share a lot. Uh, you know, she's beat them in an election, but they have a lot of respect for each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think they're, they, sh they share a lot of values. So I think we're uh, in a funny little dance right now, but I think the foundation it is a lot of mutual respect, and uh, we'll find our way through this. Uh, well, um, okay, but it's my job to suggest that, um, I don't know, because you say you've done a lot on social housing, and that is yeah. true. Yeah. I hear the mayor of Toronto say, you know, there's a billion dollars worth of repairs needed by the Toronto community housing developments, yeah. and there's no money coming forward so far from the province of Ontario to deal with that. That's his position. Is that so not true? So you know that some of the, of the money that we're collecting through cap and trade, a significant of that amount of that money is going to retrofit social housing. That work's underway now to make them more energy efficient. That's a significant saving, and I don't think anybody's factoring that into that whole calculation of how much we're investing in housing. No question. Social housing repair backlog is an issue across the province, and we are working to address that. I think one of the reasons John Tory won his election, as he did, uh, how long is it now? Three years ago, I guess, that he won, uh, was because a number of people in the capital city got tired of seeing the premier and the then mayor yeah. not on speaking terms. And they thought that the dysfunctional relationship was probably harming the smooth running of things. Uh, 
And I suspect they're concerned today that the deteriorated relationship between the premier and the mayor is causing similar problems. Is it? We've got a very good relationship. But as I said, Eglin across town. 100% benefit we to see the it. people it's, of Ontario. It's, it's one it's, minute outside the studio. Yeah, I know it. The, I know. the tunnel is, uh, is it's through it's now. It's through. moving forward. And it's, I mean, why? Well, what about the relief line? Where's the money for the relief line? So we're in constant conversations with the City of Toronto on what we can do. But I think to suggest that Ontario is not doing its share is just wrong. Uh, do you, uh, one last question on this. You know, uh, he's had Patrick Brown and Andrea Horvath down to his office and done photo ops with yeah. them. Do you object to that? No, of course not. I think he can meet with anybody he wants to. He's he's the mayor and, she, and he's the premier. Uh, she's the premier, rather. Yeah. Uh, Kathleen Wynne, and you know, one could infer from this that he's kind of trying to, you know, thumb his nose a little bit I at her by doing so. this. I wouldn't read no? anything into that at all. Okay. Well, that's what I do for a living. Okay. Um, Let's try this in our last few minutes here. You got elected in 2003. Yes. Which means you have only ever been in provincial politics on the government on side the of the government legislature. Side, yeah. Uh, uh, Which suits me just fine, by the well, way. Well, I was going to say, don't you think it's bad for democracy to have the same party in power five straight elections? Uh, not at all. Not if that party's doing really good things. <laughs> uh, have you committed to running for re-election? Yeah, I'm planning to run again. And oh, that's, uh... man. Oh, boy, I can drive a Mack truck through that sentence. I'm planning to run again? I am planning to run again. That's my plan. And you know what? It is such an exciting time to be a Liberal in Ontario. I love what I do. I love the team I work with. Why would I give that up? You, you know we are recording these interviews as well. You know we can play this tape back. Absolutely. Because when somebody says, I'm planning to run again, that is not the same as saying 110% guaranteed I'm on the ballot in the next election. So I'm running again, Steve. I'm running. Again. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. 110%. <laughs> Hundred and ten percent. How come you haven't called your nomination meeting yet? It's a year out. It's a year out. So, I'll, uh, I've been out canvassing. Things are happening. Uh, it, it would be understandable, I think, if there were a bunch of cabinet ministers and/or backbenchers who are now in their sixties, as you are, as I or am. even seventies, as, as some I'm of, not. as yet. you're not, but not as, yet. but as some of the others are, uh, not to run again. What are you hearing in terms of? Uh, Who's not going to come back? You know, I think a lot of people are starting to give it some thought now. And uh, it's like a big commitment. You know, um, I don't know that the public knows. It's a tough job. It's very demanding. We work hard, uh, long hours, almost every day of the week, usually. Uh, so, yeah, I do think that there are people who've been around a long time, uh, will choose not to run. And that will give us the opportunity to, uh, uh, to do that Revival, the renewal, which I think is really important in politics as well. Let's finish up on this. And, and you know, again, I ask people every day, you know, why isn't the Liberal government more popular? Why isn't the Premier more popular? And I was in Sault Ste. Marie not too long ago. This is well before the by-election, yeah. several months ago. And I spoke to, um, a, I think she's probably about 50 years old, a professor at, I think, Sioux College. Yeah. Who by all, you're a demographer, by all demographic experience ought to be a Kathleen Wynne voter, right? A female of a certain age, probably likes the agenda that you guys are doing. And uh, I asked her how the Premier's doing, and all I got back was a steady stream of negatives. And I'd like to know, and, you know, explored a little more, and, yeah. and the, the person really couldn't articulate especially well why she was sour on Wynne and the government, but she was. And I'd like to know what's the one thing you would say to that person to make her give your party a second look a year from tonight? I would say, take a look at what we're trying to do. Take a look at the things we are doing, the true action we're taking to build a fair Ontario. Look at what we're doing so more students can go to Sioux College uh, by offering free tuition and, and beyond free tuition for many of them. Uh, look at what we're doing on childcare, on pension reform, on a, a full range of issues that uh, that might appeal to her. And yeah. for those who say, you guys have been in for too long, it's time for a change, what's the answer? Well, change to what? And I think that when people actually see, it's not a question of do you like Kathleen Wynne or not, it's who do you want to be your premier? I have a pretty strong feeling that when they see those leaders, they will choose Kathleen Wynne. That's Deb Matthews. She's got a long title. Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development, Minister Responsible for Digital Government, Chair of the Cabinet, Deputy Premier, MPP London North Centre. We're now out of time. Thank you, Thank Minister you. Matthews, for coming into TVO tonight. Thank you. 
Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.